So hello everyone, I'm Matthew from XR Must, and I'm pleased to, to welcome videos on the on the website. And uh, one of the first one will be with the Madrid Noir team. Uh, hello James, hello Lawrence. Hey. Hey, how's it going? How are you guys? Doing good. Very well. Yeah. Very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm a bit cold, which is why I'm wearing my hat and the and the jumper, but I uh, <laughs> yeah. otherwise very well. We're yeah. suffering through the through the English winter now. Which, yeah, uh, exactly. It's not the best, but we're doing fine. Um, yeah, we're very happy to be here. I'm very excited about this. I'm mm. glad too. I miss London actually. I hope to visit soon. Um, mm. First question is is just it's about the things I ask everyone is how did you end up working on an immersive project? Maybe James, you can start. Me, M my story is the least interesting one. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I come from an animation background. I'm a designer for animated projects like that, whether that's whether whether that's um, um advertising or tv or film um and back in 2015 i think it's a long time ago i i worked i got contacted by a company called um future lighthouse and they were doing a movie called melita which was uh it, it was acquired by oculus and did like a 20 minute or maybe like a 10 minute film and i art directed on that and that was that gave me access for the first time to what it was to work in an immersive environment, how to use, how to explore narrative through, through VR uh, and all the different tools. And at the time, Google Spotlights had already been releasing some of these like narrative projects they were doing. Yeah. And I and I was very pumped. I'm very excited about those. I really thought that some of the like some of the um the steps that the, those movies were taking were really interesting, especially Pearl was something that that I was really impressed by. So I I just jumped at the opportunity and, and started working with them and learning how to use it and how to tell stories with it and write stories. And I, and I helped working on the script a little bit and, and sort of figuring out how to do certain scenes. And, and that was sort of the first seed of going into immersive. And then when I came to London um, and, uh, and I made these guys, No Ghost, um, we I just sort of completely let, like, very naively, I just went to their office and be like, "I've got an idea. Let's explore <laughs> this." And and it kind of that went on from there. But um, but I know Lawrence has a much more interesting story to tell. Yeah, well, I, you set it up for that, but I, I don't think it's that much more interesting <laughs> to be honest. I've um, so uh, my I run a studio called No Ghost, and we're the guys uh, kind of the production studio who actually developed Madrid Noir, um, and we came kind of came together at university. We were a couple of friends who met there. And, and then over the next seven or eight years, worked in visual effects within films, so around different houses within Soho. Um, and then around 2015, I would guess it was um, the DK2 started to um, be released to everybody. So it started to become more of a kind of obvious, there's a, there's a direction here to a consumer product. Um, and we had some friends who ran an animation studio uh, who had created this sort of intro to a breakfast cartoon um that they that they sort of imagined it wasn't a real breakfast cartoon and we said can we take those characters and can we put them in virtual reality can we try this it was a sort of a testing mm. environment to be honest um and so we did that in our spare time in a, in our front room at the time um and we put on an event here in london and, and expecting probably you know 50 people to turn up and watch it and we ended up with a I think 1500 people turned up to the event and um but and, and the queue to watch our three minute experience was was over an hour and a half um which was which was quite surprising to me it was amazing it was really good to see people turn out like that um and it sort of gave us the idea that okay maybe we can do this as a as a thing as a business um in some way and so that's really where we started and since then we've been working within the sort of general general you know the new ip space um and yeah. in any way all sorts of immersive storytelling whether that be for commercial or um or, or be for sort of film focused narrative stuff as well mm. all right thank you very much um i'll play the trailer then we go back to discussion Great. thank you go for it I must have been nine or ten years old when I got sent here. I 
couldn't wait to get out there and investigate my first real case. But Manolo, my uncle, really didn't have the same plan as me. This was going to be my summer? back to this um, so that was the trailer and as we speak the, the project is both av available on oculus and steam mm -hmm. yes it has been a, a pretty good year for you guys as we you premiered in tribeca uh, and you went to quite a lot of festival how do you see the the, the tour on fest xr festival and so much opportunities between hybrid event and physical online and things I think it's no, great. I think be, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I think it's especially interesting that that you can get more people into it. One of the kind of the the difficulties I found always with festivals is that you can't. Is, there's a limited amount of people that see it, whether that be for film or, or, or virtual reality itself. That's always kind of not sat particularly well with me. Um, that's always the kind of the point of the work is to get it out there and to see it. And I understand that there's a process that needs to go through in terms of funding and 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 this kind of bubble to exist for a moment around these pieces of work but it, it always seems a shame that not everybody can see it so to do more stuff online like this i think it's something that will probably stick if you know if and when the pandemic kind of comes to a close um i i feel like the remote side of the events will continue because i think it's a shame mm. to not to not show so many people it's been great for us um in a way it's been it was an interesting one because we released it during that time so when we first went to these festivals we weren't even there so we had we'd never you know outside of our office we'd never seen anyone play it hmm. um and so these people <laughs> yeah. experiencing it around the world and you know we were getting some feedback from people who were there and saying that people are enjoying it and a few you know things on social media but really we had never we had no idea really how it was being received um which was you yeah. know difficult but it turns out now after it, it takes a while of the drip feeding that i think people were enjoying it um, it seems that way anyway. Yeah, and yeah, you're, you're, it, it, is, it is real. I'm oh, sorry. No, please I'm go ahead, Matthew. Well, no, I was going to say, like, it just, it's very surreal that, that we are. It, all my friends ask me about the success and how excited you are and, and how's everything going. It's like, there's a part of me that, that doesn't understand where this movie is going because we never go with it anywhere so it's we are all the feedback mm -hmm. that we get is is in this in this office or in in their office or in my house or in my phone but it's hard to sort of see the people enjoying it um in person and and it was in taiwan like we went to the to the taiwan film festival and and we've been to all sorts of places and and we know people are seeing it and people are enjoying it because we receive the feedback, but but we're not there with it, which is always a bit of a strange feeling. Um, mm. But it's still like we're um, we're very delighted that people get to enjoy it. I think that's what Lawrence was was kind of like saying is the fact that more people can see it now than probably ever could, even though mm. we're not there for, to see it because people can actually just see it from their headsets in their home, so they don't have to go anywhere. We were at mm. some of these uh, virtual events like Alt Space or uh, the VR Chat at the. Um, for the VR awards or for rain dance, and there's people there from all sorts of places. They they just from all mm. over the world, Americans and and Polish and English and French and Spanish and and that probably would not be the case if you were to do it in 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 only one location and you yeah. had to queue to watch it. Also, it's a, it's a very long experience. So for festivals, it's always yeah. tricky because within a day, maybe ten people can watch it in like one headset a day and that just feels very um very limiting so yeah. it's it's one of those like bittersweet things where um it's 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 very cool that it, it gets to be seen by many more people um and it keeps going to these festivals it is still strange from from our side to sort of see it grow without being there with it this is strange yeah uh if we go back to the original one you you had a strategy to release the the prototype or, or prequel of the project uh three years ago which and the project this year glimpse uh did already so we i'm i was glad that finally we saw the the final project because sometimes that kind of prototype got lost but for you 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 had the first lives and you went back to production and you came back with a full length uh project mm -hmm. uh 
how, how did you work this out? What was a plan to release a prototype as a first test thing? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's exactly what it was. The prototype was a, a full, you know, it was in, in every way a prototype. It was never meant to be a finished product. It was a, a, a essentially a test for us to see if we could achieve what we wanted to. And what we wanted to really was to um, to see if we could achieve some, uh, you know, this kind of high level of um, character animation that we were really kind of lacking in a lot of the experience we were seeing. There was some great stuff out there, interesting tech and interactions being tested, but there would seem to be this sort of lack of quality. The quality bar wasn't very high for character animation. So we wanted to try that. And also just to try making this a, a sort of, sort of handmade but almost like along the lines of hand drawn aesthetic to everything something that was really nicely designed um and got sort of but had a good reason for existing and fit within the world and the world had its own had its own little rules and they all kind of everything fit together in that and that was the test so doing it with these characters animated nicely inside this sort of theatrical environment um was the point of that so it was it was we we never really meant to release it i don't think we ever really at the time i don't think we ever thought about whether we would release it or not really we just sort of made it um and then used that as the kind of platform to to look for funding and to try and say to people look we think it works um could, maybe you'd like to come on board and, and, and help us make a bigger version of this yeah i think it's interesting because for most of other projects that release a prototype that when they release the final thing, the prototype is still very much part of the full experience. Yeah. Whereas we did a, a short film, and then the, pro, the 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 product that ended up coming out of it has pre, has nothing to do with the short film. It's very different <laughs> in tone, in the characters are different, it looks different. It's it was one step in the right direction, but then we scrapped everything and we started from scratch. So it was very much like like Lawrence was saying, it, it was a playground because in VR there's always this. Like what I I've been saying I've been calling it like the, like defining the language of the project because in VR is so you can do anything and that yeah. can sometimes be counterproductive to telling a story mm. because you Absolutely. have to find what what's going to be your what are going to be your limitations what are going to be your rules what's what what are the rules of this project when it comes to telling stories so we had we had theorized a lot about this idea of the theater language to be implemented into VR but. As we know in VR, it's all about you gotta test it. You cannot just theorize and just because you can't really like you know put your hand in the fire or or get money just because you have an idea that you think is gonna work. So this felt to us was more than anything was does our aesthetic look? Can we do this animation? Can we use the theater language to tell the story? Use the spotlight, use this, da, 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 like fit, like test all these things. Thankfully, I think we were successful on that, and that gave us also. Uh, a little bit of trust in our own instincts and then throughout the project there was a lot of moments where we kind of were developing this this gut feeling where like when it came to like is this going to work in vr is it going to work within our project and we kind of because we have that pre prior experience we had developed a little bit of that that instinct that ended up being very helpful for the final production mm. Mm. and from a from a technology point of view the, the tools you had and, and we know the xr industry is evolving fast um, what was the evolution between the prequel, the prototype, and the final project? Do, do you have the feeling that you had the same possibilities? Well, the big, the big, yeah, I mean, the big jump for us was going from uh, a tethered headset to a mobile one. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah, the original prototype was could run on any any gaming PC or any VR ready PC they were calling it at the time, and I think that you know that was very helpful for us at the, because we had to worry a lot less about performance and how things would run which was uh, to be honest the total opposite experience of making the real thing um on uh, on the quest because that is uh you know you're you're squeezing a huge thing into a very small box um mm. and ripping out anything you can without compromising the project the project itself um so that was the big jump for us i think the change interactive it was nice to know that sort of we could do it interactively now when we did the original project the original prototype that sort of um we didn't know if it was meant to be interactive we mm. we were kind of that was another thing we were testing we didn't really we didn't put anything in, interactive in the end in it 
but throughout the process, we had a few things where we thought maybe this could be interactive, maybe, and, and it never really quite worked. Whereas when we moved on to the next one, we were like, there's, there's got to be interaction in this. It's a key part of writing and creating stories for VR. No matter how kind of low level or, um, or, or light that interaction is, I think with if without it, there's just, it's a different experience. It's not necessarily a worse experience, but if you're looking to make something that is um, as immersive as possible but and, and engaging, but also sort of gives people the chance to build those sort of little memories that happen. Like there's there's a, a lot of people that um, in, uh, play Madrid Noir, the first thing they do, there's a pipe on the table in front of them. Yeah, and um, it's a bit, it's kind of a spoiler because people love discovering this, but you can pick up the pipe and you put it in your mouth and it sits there in your mouth for the rest of the scene. Um, and just like, doing those tiny little things seems to be those those sort of like hooks that, that make people really remember the experience, even if they're not watching the story. Um, mm -hmm. they, they kind of, it, it makes them feel part of the world and, and that seems to be a, a big bonus overall. And so I think going from totally passive to fully interactive was a big jump for us, but it was a really good one. It was a big learning curve as well and, and a kind of sort of um, a, a production challenge because we, we'd not done something interactive on that scale before, but it was, mm. um, that was the big difference, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I remember there was a moment when we were making the, the, the prologue, the short film, yeah. that I think, because the quest had not come out to the market when we were doing the short film they came out when as we were finishing production and i remember when we came to the office and that's at one point one of our engineers had like put a uh, had managed to put like a box within like an an app within the quest and that was like yeah. a gigantic achievement that we figured out how to like <laughs> make something that works on quest even if he's just seen some some cubes floating in space um and then fast forward a year and a half we have to put in a 45 minute long animated project into that so there was quite a lot of like learning like a learning curve on like how to produce and create for the quest that was the big challenge I, from my perspective i don't come from a technical background so i had to do a lot of like learning with them and then hearing what how how, I, how we had to approach certain things and what were our limitations and what could work and what couldn't work um so on the on the on the short film for example i think like it's only one set with one scene but within that scene, there's like 10 times more information than there is in like, I don't know, like like the whole apartment section of Madrid Noir. Yeah, Just yeah. because everything is rigged, everything is like high, high definition models, everything has like high textures, everything is enormous. So there was no limit to what we could do. And then when we came to the quest, we had to like really strip back and be much more efficient with the way that we design some of the spaces. and make sure that we don't we couldn't overdo certain amount of polygons and we couldn't you know there was very there's sometimes where we couldn't have so many characters in the same scene so we had to like write some of the scenes to be able to write off some characters just so we could carry yeah. on with the story because the project wouldn't work mm. so that that part of it was a little bit tricky but at the same time like i said before sometimes limitations force you to be a little bit more creative and you come up with ideas of do we really need so much stuff in this scene? Can we make it more abstract? Can we make it a bit more simple? And that normally tends to be beneficial for the story anyway. Mm. Uh, in that way, does the um, film noir genre helps to, I don't know, black backgrounds, a few mm -hmm. lights, stuff like that? Does that help to, to build? Because it builds, like you said, the theater stage of things. I think it's really physical, but you, you can play with the darker size of yeah. the... But that's it was always part of the like the the, the pitch is that um, in theater you can make you can go from a from from an exterior with a bench and and a and a, and a backdrop of a park and a, a street light and that's a street and then you you turn it and you have a, a dinner table and and a candlelight and a couple of like things and then you are in a in a in a kitchen and mm. it's instantly you change it and it's super cheap because you only need props and people's minds sort of fill up the space and make the rest. So that was always a way of saying, this could be easy to produce, cheap to make, because we don't have to make all these props. And then it means that we, we can keep the player on the same place and we don't have to like constantly be moving them around and create these enormous scenes with the sky domes and lights and, and all this stuff. Because that we knew that that wasn't ever going to work because it was too much, it was too big and it would never look the way we wanted it to look. So if you want to keep it, keep it, keep it small, keep it clear, 
just find ways of stripping away all the noise and just go to the essential. And for us, and it allows that kind of like it, it, it finds that perfect. I think it it finds that nice level of suspension of disbelief, which is you yeah. know, like James says, you can get from theatre from just a few props, and that was for us sort of the exciting part that we didn't have to build this. And I think it's something that is the whenever you're designing something for VR, whoever you are, I think it's always the first thing is like, okay, how much can we put into this? How real? Not how real necessarily, but how how complex and and varied can we make the environment around people? when actually maybe you'll never be as good as people's imaginations. So just giving them the seed for that um, is, is maybe the most interesting way to do it. And for this project, it really works. Maybe for others, it won't. But I think that was that was a pretty interesting thing to play with for us. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you work around the balance between uh, the story and the interactive parts? How, how do you find that tone? Hard. Really in a hard. Story, <laughs> it was very hard. Yeah, really hard. A lot of nights out in the courtyard out here, me and James shouting at each other. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a difficult. It was a very difficult thing because we wanted to make sure that that firstly, story was key, right? That was the main thing of this project was that the narrative is the important thing. You should you should be there and you should be part of it, but you should be still you should still feel like you're taken along for the ride, like on a log flume or something like that. You should feel very much. Like you're on a log flume picking things off from the side or something like that. That you, and, and that was really hard because we went through, you know, the first few iterations we did were totally, I mean, it sort of made sense to find a narrative, um, were, were totally passive. And mm -hmm. then we started to in inject these kind of, we had these feelings, we did, a, we actually did another prototype, um, <laughs> which has never, only a small section of people have seen. Um, which was which was almost the opposite. It was totally interactive. It was almost like a full game, where yeah. you were going to control the um, Manolo, the 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 uncle character, around the apartment, and you'd be investigating things and you'd be finding clues um, and, and essentially solving a mystery totally yourself. And mm. we, we came up with some very strange solutions for a lot of things, like this idea. We had this big oh, argument. Some of them were really you, cool. When you looked through his magnifying glass. When he looked through it, would you hold up a magnifying glass and see like what he was seeing just through the magnifying glass and the kind of these 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 ways round what we'd already set out as the rules being the theater world and, and mm. the way you looked at it and then and then trying to find interactive methods through that. And it just sort of it was it was fun and it made some interesting points, but it very much put story to the side. Um, it, it wasn't, and, and also this kind of our other goal, which was to make a character that was very believable um, and, and three-dimensional that you could you could be you know in a room with, um, and who acknowledged your presence. And in this prototype, that really didn't happen. It was very much like a third-person sort of looking at game. Yeah. Um, so, to, so to, that was that was the really hard thing is to try and find that level, um, and and we pushed it really far in one direction, and we pushed it really far in the other direction, and we ended up a bit further towards the passive version but um mm. it was finding those key moments where you trying to find the way you felt that you were helping lola make the discoveries even though if they were in a very light way that she couldn't quite have done it without you that was that was mm. where we tried to hit the bar yeah i think it, that i mean talking about interaction is tricky because We've gone through. It took us a while to to understand where within our project interaction fit and actually was yeah. beneficial to the story, because there were times where we were really thinking of like there should be interaction through the entire thing. Like we were at one point we were thinking like you should control the spot of the theater or you can pull up levers or like um, yeah. you know sort of pull like um, ropes and levers and and activate different mechanisms and and play with the theater and and help the characters go from one scene to another and. And we really like discussed ways of like, you know, making sure that you would be constantly engaged. But we realized that at one point it was if we, we couldn't do a 50 50 story, 50 percent uh, interaction because they were they were like oil and water the way mixing or okay, keg. It wasn't working. Um, and we had to be it, it had to be more 80 20 one way or the other, because otherwise these two things are both of them fighting for this for, for attention. So we mm -hmm. kind of went because Lawrence and I have a, a, a broader interest in, in in storytelling and cinema and narrative. We ended up going in that direction because we felt much more comfortable. And also we felt like it was the most there's already a lot of games in VR and we kind of felt like the the, the sweet, interesting stuff is happening in that cross cross line between 
narrative and interaction. We wanted to stay there. Um, so we made sure that we, so once we figured out that we wanted to split the story into two different time, time periods, it became easier because then we knew mm. that like we could, we can, let's keep all interaction to one part of the story that happens in the 1950s. And then we keep all the other passive stuff to the 1930s. And that really helped because then we knew within what rails we could play, like what, what were the limitations of what we could do. And then with once we knew that that was the space, we were then the question became, let's test a bunch of different things. So we tested a bunch of different interactions, like you know, with the camera, with the magnifying glass, with like all these different things. And then we choose the ones that we felt were the most fun to do. Mm -hmm. And then we started trying to write them into the story. So I was like, okay, it'd be interesting to grab a gun. Like, wouldn't it be interesting if you could like grab the gun or you you would be the one taking the you know, like 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 Pavlov's gun, right? In the story, in in writing, like if the, like the moment a gun appears, it has to like come back into the story, right? So it was like, wouldn't it be interesting if you were to do that? So how can we mix all these storytelling devices? And and sort of the, the point in the story is to to make you in, invested in what's going on, but also make sure that it's always further in the story, it's never distracting, because that was the biggest problem that we had. Is that even now, like sometimes people on on the first scene. Some people are just playing with all the different stuff and they don't pay attention to anything Lola's saying. And we knew that if we were to allow interaction for the entire project, people would be so distracted, it would be impossible to tell them a story. So it's more like, let's limit it and let's make sure that we treat them like almost like, like babies in a way, like because we know that everybody will behave their worst when they're given the chance to do so. So let's not give them too many chances to break the story. Let make sure that they can carry on with the story, with, the, with with what's going on, but they feel like they they are being able to help and are being able to further the story forward. And they make discoveries before even Lola does, because I I, I don't want to go into I I, I was just going to say a massive spoiler, but <laughs> the fact that you see certain things before she does yeah. is very important because it makes the player sort of be participant on on her reaction and and being mm -hmm. invested in her feelings. And yeah. that that is the most like surprising thing when you see the project is that people really interact with her in a way that for them feels very real and they talk back to her all the time. Like I, when I see my friends mm -hmm. wearing it, like, I, I just went to Spain for a few weeks and I brought the headset with me and people were do, um, watching the film and they all talk back to her all the time. And to me, that is very funny because it tells me that they they've made like the, in their brain, they've made a connection that she somehow there with them and and is is breach that gap of mm. of immersion um and those are my favorite moments when people just get very attached to her it's very nice yeah yeah i apologize because i may have spent too much time playing with things and opening drawers and, and <laughs> that's fine everybody that's fine. experiences the way they want to it's fine it's totally exactly fine. that's the you I mean being aware that no that, that's that's one of the like kind of big rules that we put in straight away is being aware and i think you need to be any any sort of VR work you're doing, and maybe even XR as a whole, you need to be aware that no, almost nobody's going to do what you want them to do. Um, yeah. And so you have to give them opportunity to find their way back to that, um, because other it, it's just not going to happen. You can't, you know, you don't have these the lovely constraints of of two D cinema where where you say you you show them what to look at. You can't do that. Mm. Um, so mm. People could experience it, not even touch anything, and look at the floor the entire time. And you can't, you can't obviously um, prepare for every everything that anyone's any, ever going to do. But to be aware that it's not going to go the way you want it to is, is is a sensible thing, I think, to to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. It's interesting the, the the cinema influence, and and of course the film noir is is a big draw in, in cinema, mm. in the cinema industry. But I have the feeling that you choose a, a genre that is quite rich and, and complex and you can play with a lot of things, um, especially in an, in an interactive story when you can you need to look for things and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what were your, I don't know, your favorite movies or did you had a, a mood board with some big names and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, visually in terms of lighting, the third man was, was, was very much the obvious one for us. That was, mm -hmm. you know, Hannes. The beautiful sort of cobbled streets and we saw this kind of like and you know sort of this similarity between the way that that works and the way that madrid looks because madrid has this kind of i mean i'll let james speak more um 
lovingly about this because Madrid is his city, but um, the, the, the kind of the way that Madrid is, it's not never really been featured in a lot of films, especially in this sort of genre. Um, but it has this kind of incredible contrast between light and dark. It has these beautiful kind of mixture between man-made and organic that just just creates these beautiful scenes, um, uh, yeah. especially at nighttime. Um, yeah, and that and that kind of it, it, it made it made a lot of sense to us. Um, not only in in a kind of narrative and poetic sense for James, but also in a production sense for us. Mm. James, maybe? Yeah, in terms of, yeah, films, that was, we we're looking at a lot of different things. I think, like, I'm personally a big fan of, of noir in general. Like, I like, I love Chinatown. I love LA Confidential. Like, all these movies, just like, mm. they they have a specific, they, it's one of these genres that, that it goes beyond just the black and white or the, light and shadow there's a specific tone and specific like uh, visual resources that they can use with the that they can go and that's i think why some some movies they go really really abstract is because it, it the, the the genre itself is kind of like allowing for it like because the more graphic you go with it the more you accentuate the uh, the, the the shadow the reflection the silhouette of somebody against a door it's almost asking you to be more flat and more graphic. And, and that is always something that attracted me a lot because you can really play with it the way that all the genres just don't allow. Um, and and yeah, there's like double indemnities, which are also a very uh, big one for me. I really like it. Mm. Um, yeah, and then as Lawrence, just to complement what he was saying about Madrid, I think there's that element of narrow streets, um, it's a city that is sort of like it's very undulating, sort of like ups and downs. It's a lot of like ways that you can use the camera to like show layers. Also, it's one of the is especially in the thirties. Um, it's a it's a very old city, so it has like you can find layers of that go back to the Romans. Oh. So you can find a street lights and trams, sort of through roads, cobble roads that were originally like you know put on by the Romans and then walked by Napoleon and and you know like there's so much history everywhere so there's always like it's a city that feels like this it's just layers upon layers upon layers of of stuff that went on that you walk around completely ignoring it but if you just knew the stuff that's happening it happens in any in any European city really I think like Paris must be is the same thing you just walk around and you're like people were like you know like fighting with swords in the street like Romans were walking these these streets at one point. Like it's crazy. Like with the, like the stuff that we just take for granted, and that's something that always like fascinated me. And when we, it came to de designing the project, I felt I feel because originally I even thought like, well, we, we should set this story in New York or in Chicago or you know yeah. where you assume all these stories normally take place. But it felt a little bit disgenuine. It felt a little bit like it wasn't really adding anything. To the like it, it was too expected and i felt like it would be much more genuine if, if like why if we were to do it in madrid like why wouldn't we why wouldn't we use uh this and uh, at first i was afraid that it was going to be alienating because it's a little bit maybe it's too specific but it's kind of the opposite it's become sort of like mm -hmm. something that it, it, it makes it exotic to some degree right um especially for americans so it's very um in that regard i'm very happy that i've been able to sort of explore my city and and, and portray it in this way um, and then all these movies that we've been talking about, they all give us different cues. Like sometimes it's about the the way the characters speak, like getting the language was a very important thing. I think that's mm. something that Lawrence worked really hard on, like getting the specific type of like hard boiled language that you have to like nail sometimes to do like good a good noir film, um, especially in the section where, mm, should I say this? No. No, I should say it. Okay. No. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to spoil it. Um, but but that section of the movie. Sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, I think I think as well to, to that point specifically about how the, how the language is used. I mean, that's that was very much you know, film noir is was a really important influence to us in the cinema as a whole, especially cinema in the kind of thirties to forties. But I, well, and silent film. I don't know if that's we, mm. we haven't actually spoken about really. Silent film was a big thing in this. So you know, um, the work Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, those sort of people that were kind of able to tell a story. Um, without any words and obviously for us doing an animation project that was quite important and so kind of to mix those two things was always what part of the like original soup of how this project worked as well as mm. as well as i think really as james said the like hard-boiled noir fiction as well that was you know so obviously the work of raymond chandler is the biggest in this yeah. sort of area but we were both reading um 
the Mask of Demetrius by Eric Amber at the time. Um, oh, the Postman Always Rings Twice. Those sorts of things, these big famous um, uh, detective novels. But those kind of, you, you, have to, you can open any of those books and within the first few lines, it just sets this unbelievable sort of tone. Not only is it cool, but it has this kind of like feeling of smoothness and everything rolls off the tongue. And it feels like, like I said earlier with the log flume, you're being taken on a river um, this whole way. And that was kind of something we wanted to try and get into the story is this, you're always getting one viewpoint. You know the whole way through that something's not right. There's something mm. up. Um, and that's yeah. sort of the beauty of, of detective fiction. But to do that, in a way that, in, that kind of felt cool and smooth and really like, but really sort of grabbed you and pulled you along in a way that you, you couldn't really resist was super mm. important to us. But also that's kind of where the music came in as well. Like the music does so much for setting the tone. Um, we have an unbelievable composer we work with called Carlos Rodriguez Rodriguez. He is uh, incredible at what he does um, and sort of comes like you give him this brief, this quite a complex thing where you say, we need it to have this sort of tone. It's this sort of moment. Um, it needs to use the theme tunes of all these characters. And it also needs yeah. to dictate the way the action's moving. And, and it, it has to be jazzy and, does... and noir yeah. and also a bit of chotis and a little bit. Yeah. This is like a Spanish a specific type of song, like chotis, mm. a little bit of, of um, um, Fazuela, which is another type of music. Yeah. And, and he, he was just, back he just like it. nodded, just like, yeah, sure, I can do that. And then he just literally three days after that, it's like this perfect composition comes out. Yeah, um, it's, so it's, it's an amazing thing to see, and it's it, it is you know it's a huge part of the experience. There's no way that it could exist without it. Yeah. Um, and it's that sort of, especially when you're doing something that is kind of semi-silent. There's there is narration during during some parts of it, and there's talking, but there's all these times when you were trying to communicate mood or emotion of character without do, using camera shots and POVs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we the music does a, all the, a huge amount of the legwork there. Yeah, mm. absolutely. I just before we finish with uh, genre, I want to I want to mention something that um, that I think I I don't know if we were as aware when we were doing it, but I think in in retrospect is it, I've realized that it was very very helpful. Is that attaching the project to a to a genre that has such a specific structure and a specific like points mm. that you have to like you have to reveal certain information at certain points you have to set up certain things in a certain way and it has to like be at a specific time within the story it 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 can feel very limiting but it it, it was such it was so helpful to just have yeah. like those that like a genre that gave us a structure that we, we could follow <laughs> so we can experiment but we know that if we if we hit these notes it's gonna sound okay like it's gonna it's gonna work and that if we were to do something that was much more a slice of life, maybe a little bit more artistic, a little bit more abstract in terms of like a structure, it would have again added that level of like anything is possible, anything can work. And then it just sort of we, we will be in 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 the problem of maybe like going in circles too much. Whereas mm -hmm. go again, going to these movies, going to these books, reading like doing all this research, it really like helped us to be like once we once we want to do the one thing is the story you want to tell, and a different thing is the plot. Like how do you plot this whole thing? And mm. what that needs to happen every five minutes, what is information that needs to go through, and that really helped to set the to to set the the pace of the story, what mm. needs to happen, how do you work on certain scenes, and and a lot of the times it was more like, like we knew where we what like what what needed to happen at minute I don't know thirty five, this needs to be revealed, how do we go from minute thir like twenty to minute thirty five I don't know let's try to like <laughs> find a way to like do the story and that sort of that was really helpful in order to like build something that people can like follow and understand and that yeah. was really really helpful so I, I would recommend if anybody wants to like like don't be afraid of taking a genre and 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 um analyze it and strip it of all the like um sort of beautifying elements and just like look at how those stories are told and follow mm -hmm. that because otherwise it's again it's like the idea of the the language of a project in VR because you need to have certain structure and certain limitations to what you want to do. Otherwise, it's, it's, it can be a little bit too much of an abstract experience um, and it can be hard to follow. Especially if you start add, if you're adding devices all over the place. So in our sense, the, this, the idea of two timelines, one running in the past, one running now, yeah. different perspectives. As soon as you start adding that on top of 
your story as well. That start, it's just it's so complicated. Um, it's very difficult to to unpick it at any point. Mm. Um, and that was kind of our experience, especially where we'd, we'd, we'd like James says, we'd reach this point, we'd like, right, we need to deliver this information. Okay, this is how we're going to deliver it and how we're going to get there. Yes, but obviously that's broken the timeline, that's broken the rules of the world, that's broken the, the flow of the experience, all these things would have to run back again. And so we, there was a lot of this kind of back and forward, butting your head. To, I mean, this is how you write any script, but still it was that kind of, as James says, if you can have something in the core that you can sort of rely on and check back against and say, right, well, I, is this going to, are we still sort of following this general structure? That's going to be really helpful because otherwise you can just get lost totally the whole time. Mm. And, and thanks for bringing the music. Um, I, I was I was going to ask for, for about the music, but is it somewhere available online? Just a soundtrack or? I I believe I'm not totally sure of it. I believe it is. Um, I believe so. We yeah. we have to check because it it is it. We did ended up uh, breaking it into tracks and making like an album of it. Um, okay. But I know there's some specific, like there's some. Um, um, things that have to do with the with distribution rights and all these things that we're sort of yeah. finishing up, but th that's we want to make sure that that is up um, soon um, yeah. next yeah. year, uh, at, like latest next year, early next year, because um, I think it's it's too good to not let everybody just like enjoy it in, in Spotify and just have it in the background because it's, yeah. it's just too yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely the plan. Whether it, whether it's there or not yet, we're not one hundred percent sure, but the plan is yet yeah. for it to be available. Yeah. We should be sure about this sort of stuff, Lawrence. We should be sure. Um, we should be sure. We should know this. Of us yeah. Really, are the producers on this? So. <laughs> This video is not going online. Oh, right. All oh, right. Um, <laughs> final, maybe final question, and, and maybe uh, one important one is about animation because we discussed the background and stuff like, and stuff about the, the project. But I, I have the feeling that anima animation is uh, one of the best uh, ways to explore VR. Um, what's your view? Maybe Lawrence, as a studio producer, uh, is animation for you a, a great playground uh, for immersive content? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no question there. There's, it's, um, it's something as a studio we've always been kind of, I think, probably more focused on than a lot of other studios um, in, in this space is that we, we very much sort of set ourselves up as somebody, as people who would do animated projects, but specifically high quality animated projects. So we were really, uh, we really wanted to do um, VR and XR storytelling. And, you know, and that is our kind of like main aim. But in order to do that, we kind of see the you know the power of character and animated stuff as as, as one of the real key ways to go about it. Um, it has always been it's something that not only I suppose part of that was because of our it was our skill set when we started that we'd all worked within stuff um, where animation had always been pretty high priority. Um, but also in terms of you know I think it's it, it, it's sort of that it's for us it's a bit of a kind of keystone or a gateway into into the storytelling because you allow yourself this to break free of the constraints of reality, right? You, you don't, you're not trying to replicate real life, you're defining something new. Um, mm. And by tying yourself totally to the real world, for example, I don't know whether that's doing live action or doing scans, yeah. for us, that's sort of too close to the real world. We're looking for an open plane, uh, a completely blank page to start with. And, and the way to do that is to start to look at who's going to live in that world um, and, and and by being untied to real people um, it sort of for us Fuck works. Real people. Yeah, <laughs> but it, as a story as a storytelling technique I think it works yeah. as a, a, a as a key to give you that um, playground to be like okay who lives here um, and then mm. once you start to define who lives here you start to define the world and the story that they're going to go about um, and it gives you that kind of detail and touch tone to that world. Um, mm. Yeah, for us, that's 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 kind of how it feels. And I think, you know, there's there is there's there was a lot of experiments with virtual reality at the beginning with realism, and I think there will be places for that. You know, there's if you just take something like Half Life, Alex, right? It's probably pretty. It's as close, very close to realism as a in a in a large experience as we, as we've got. But and it has it's great, it's brilliant, it works really well. But I don't think that we should be tied to that necessarily. There's loads of things that are going to work in VR really well, as well as there's loads of things that work well in cinemas, in novels, in theatre. There's mm. going to be loads of directions that eventually get pushed and we'll, we'll end up with genres and with sort of sections of the market. Um, 
and for us the most interesting area at the moment is is doing sort of animated stories or, or at least stories that use animation um mm. yeah. to to explore the narrative yeah yeah i think it also gives you that level because in vr everything can be scrutinized because you are in the same world as these people these characters and you need because of the iterative uh, nature of vr you need to test a lot of things and you need to be able to make certain choices sometimes really later like late on to the project when you're trying to do 3d scans and and you are kind of limited to what you have and you're kind of limited to the to what you've captured and you cannot really like go in and redo it or change it and, and i think that that's where animation ends up becoming a very logical way to go because it just gives you that extra level of like controlling and and so mm. knowing that you can you can mm. Completely change the, the the performance of this character within a few days of work, rather than having to go through the whole process again of of capturing it. But then again, it's probably because we come from that world. I think anybody, if people come to VR from from dance or, or cinema, and they they have a specific understanding of what they want when it comes to their performance and their experience, then they bring something else. But I think from 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 us, I think that's where Nogos and I sort of see things in a similar way. Um, that is where it becomes really interesting. What Lawrence was saying is that that um, defining the rules of this world, we we can define them. We don't have to um, sort of, um, you know, we can make things from scratch, and that that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I feel like it, it is. I would love it for more anime, like more people from the animation world, to start coming more and more into VR, because I feel like it's one of those. Is this is one of those those technologies that is going to give a lot of wings to the medium like it's going to allow it to go places that it's never been able to go it's going to allow creatives to to think about animation in a way that they haven't been able to think before and and it's really gonna find a like a place of its own where it is going to exist in a different plane as all the other animation oh. stuff and i think mm -hmm. eventually will um we're still just very early in that time but i'm very interested to see what what's going to come out of of people that are more native to VR. Like for them, VR is not just like a novelty and they really like understand it and they've grown with it and they 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 know how to use it. Um, because those things are gonna be, those are gonna be very interesting times when people can- But you can, can see why it's a, sorry, carry on James. No, no, before, I'm, I'm, you can I'm, see why I'm it's a, You can see why I think the people James are talking about may be apprehensive though, because it's a big jump. Oh. You, all of the, essentially, almost all the rules of what you've learned across the career, especially in animation, are gone. Yeah that you can, you know, you, you're, you're back to pure performance. Um, you don't have, you know, you don't necessarily have silhouettes anymore. You don't have any way, you don't have framing devices, none of that. You, you just have to be performance only. But in the end, you know, that's kind of like, I think that's why it works so well, because you get this directness, you get this ability to, you just like, you know, if you say the performance of various things, then the performance is everything and you can only communicate through that. And so if, if it needs to be a snappier scene, you don't have mm. to do anything with the environment. You just, you just animate it in that way. You know, they, mm. there's a kind of, you tell the story directly through the characters rather than the story being told around the characters, basically. Yeah. But the same goes the other way. I think like people that come from, the tech side that want to mm. tell stories and they want to use this medium bring people from the animation world into your teams because they're all they're the ones that are going to know how to create things and how to tell stories and how to like use these characters in these worlds to like be able to to facilitate the storytelling um i think like this because in animation you end up becoming this you are a study like you are you are a a an student of cinema but also of 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 painting and of all these other of all these other mediums right and you end up having a very broad tool toolbox to be able to address all these potential problems that you may have while trying to tell a story um and i feel that you know it's, it's one of those things where like is is the beauty always happens when like mediums collide and they can compenetrate and work together and and they come up with you know like with it we might do not a lot of the times so, like a lot of amazing ideas came from things that i would have never thought about because i'm not an engineer and i'm not that that um, I'm not an expert in inter interaction, but sometimes it's where those things sort of collide that that we really, yeah. you know, you come up with moments of, there's no way nobody would have thought of this outside of this particular medium.
because this mm. like the way that these are compenetrating is not like a video game it's not like a movie it's not like theater it's not like anything else it's its own thing and it can only happen within this medium and i think those moments are the ones that i'm 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 excited about like i want to see more projects coming into the in the future that make me think like well that somebody just took one step further than what i've seen so far and then there's going to be another one and there's going to be another one and then we slowly are all bit like there'll like there'll be a whole line of projects that are building a path into into what the new sort of era of animated stuff in VR is going to be. And that's where we'll get the language from. The language that James has been referring to throughout the whole this the whole mm. discussion is is that that language is still undefined. It's yeah. what we've you know it's why one of the reasons why VR is so exciting to me and I know to my team and and to James as well is because it is this wild west. There's the rules aren't set. Um, yeah. And being here now is kind of the exciting thing is that you might be part of that creating of those rules. But what it, the, the most important thing is that you're not you're not contained by them. You can do what you know, you can essentially do what you like and say, right, these are the rules now. Um, mm. And you can believe in that and that's OK. But, you know, everyone else is doing that at the same time. And eventually we'll start to come to some kind of consensus as, you know, as cinema has now after 120 years, there's it's kind of got this rule set that has now slowly been communicated to the audience as well. Audiences know how to watch a film now. Um, yeah. A lot of audiences don't know how to watch VR and some some of them are kind of slowly learning and getting used to it. You see that with people who work in VR now that it's very comfortable for them to jump into any experience. I'm sure that's the same with you, Mathieu. But it's um, other people um, need to be taught those rules and the more experiences and the more experimentation, but also the more building on other people's successes that happen mm the more that language will become defined, I think. That's a, that's a good hand for, for our interview. Uh, just a, a last final question is uh, maybe we will, I will call you back in one or two years to, to check on, on that. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. Final question is, uh, what about next project? What's in the next, uh, maybe 2022? So as expected, there, 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 are, there are more projects that are under NDAs. Um, that um, there are, they are. I mean, the thing to tell, to tell you, we're working on. Um, no, this is a studio working on lots of different projects at the moment in multiple parts of the immersive space. Um, we are working on some larger narrative projects, um, similar to the same lines in Madrid Noir, um, and also between No Ghost and James, we are also working on something that is in the immersive space, but it's not. It's not VR necessarily. Um, mm. it's, uh, but it is a story we've been working on for about six months now, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I and mean, for me, it's kind of like, um, similar. I'm, I'm now that Madrino is out, um, it's sort of giving me that sort of confidence to be able to write again, like keep writing my own projects and my own stories and, and the collaboration with Nogos has been really good. And with Lawrence artistically, we kind of speak very similar languages so we we have one project together that we're kind of moving forward um to see how that goes and then i've got i'm i'm on my spare time i'm kind of writing other projects to 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 keep exploring narrative um some of them could potentially be turning to vr some of them could not be vr like there's one of those things but i i think with no like no goes the same way it's like it being constrict um constrained just by just making vr it's a little bit too mm too tidying, too like um, um, suffocating. So we are coming up with ideas for narratives and then we're kind of like exploring what would that look like if it were to be VR or if it were to be AR, if it were to be, you know, something else um, and how could that be interesting? And, and, yeah. and but there's, there's definitely that crossover between tech and storytelling that yeah. somehow everything we think about ends up falling ends into up that there, yeah. line somehow yeah. um, that I think we are we are excited about. All right. Thank you, guys, both. Um, for those who are watching, just follow us on social media and likes and stuff and stuff and stuff. <laughs> I'm really glad I had a chance to, to talk to you both. Uh, thank you for Madrid Nights online on Steam and Oculus. Yes. And, uh, and see you soon. I thank guess. you very much, Mathieu. Thank you for your time. So nice. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye.